have a Bible with you, if you would turn to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. You've heard me say this, uh, some of the biblical names are hard to pronounce, and I tell people you can pronounce them any way you want to. Um, Ezekiel chapter 16, we're going to read a few verses there in just a moment. But I'd like to um, 
I've uh, got a couple questions I want to uh, ask you today. You know, uh, going to church, worshiping the Lord is not a spectator event. It is something that you and I as believers are to be involved in. And today is going to be a hands-on kind of service, or maybe I should say a hands-up service. Um, how many of you today would love to see revival come? Let me see your hands. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. Every last one of us would love to see revival, wouldn't we? Okay. I want you to, to think with me for just a moment. Give some thought to this. What do you suppose our world will look like in 20 years? What will our world what will our country, what will our culture look like just 20 years from now? And that thought is relevant to this message today. I'm going to save my title for just a few moments. Uh, I'll work my way up to that. In Ezekiel chapter 16, Verse 1 begins this way, and Jonathan, thank you for praying for me this morning. Church members, thank you for praying for me. I want you to pray for me today. Ezekiel said again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. You'll find that expression many, many times in the Old Testament, especially. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying. And Ezekiel said again, and I believe for this prophet and all the other prophets, that that was a familiar experience with him. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Now, let me ask you this question. Who today would want that job? Let me see your hands. Come on now, this is a hands, hands on, hands up. Would you want that job, Dennis? Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. I want to give you a little background here to, to this book it's, that's important to this message. Um, historically and biblically, Israel was a house divided. The Lord made the statement in Mark's gospel that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Israel was a house divided. The northern division of Israel in 722 B.C. was annihilated by the Assyrians. The southern part of Israel, known as Judah, in 605 B.C., the Babylonians came and destroyed much of the nation and carried away captive many of the people from Judah to Babylon. Now, let me say this. God gave to Jacob the name Israel. And God refers to the northern kingdom is already gone. I mean, it, it doesn't exist at the time of this writing. But God had given to Jacob the name Israel. And that name Israel applied to this people known as God's chosen people. The name Israel means one who 
contends with or clings to God. And brothers and sisters, in the book of Ezekiel, the northern kingdom of Israel is already gone. But God refers to this people of Judah as Israel. God gave his chosen people this name Israel. And he meant for them to own it and live it as a people who contends with and clings to God. Now, how do we contend with God? I believe, brothers and sisters, in prayer. Just like Jacob of old, he wrestled with the Lord in prayer. And the Lord said to Jacob, let me go. And he said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. And in that, that experience, God gave him this name of Israel. And I believe that God would have his people today to own that name and to own that attitude to contend with God and cling to God in every circumstance. In every circumstance. As I said, in 605 B.C., the Babylonians came and destroyed much of Judah, carried away many of them captive to Babylon. And so what we're reading here takes place sometime between 605 B.C. and 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians completely destroyed Jerusalem and the temple there. And likely Ezekiel's writing was on the lower end of that date between 605 and 586. I mean, they're close to the very end, even for the nation of Judah. Now, notice what God says here. He says, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And he goes on to say, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, thy mother a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these things unto thee, to have compassion on thee, but thou wast cast out into the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I'm going to stop reading there. Verse 6. Last week I spoke about the Egyptians killing all the Hebrew babies. We're not going to go over that again. God is, is revealing to his people Israel that they were like an unwanted child. That someone had thrown out into the open field. And I want to tell you, that would not have been an uncommon experience for people in that day. You see, people in every generation have found a way to get rid of unwanted children. But God here in his infinite love and mercy, he said, when I passed by you, I found you as this unwanted child. Read the rest of this chapter if you would. It's a long one, but read the rest of it. God said, I took you, I took you up in my arms and I washed you and I clothed you and I put jewels on you. I put a crown on your head and I blessed you. But and then he said, but you played the harlot with everyone that passed by. And we'll get to the reason why Judah or Israel was in the shape that they were in in just a few moments. 
Ezekiel was called upon by God. Son of man, I want you to tell Jerusalem her abominations. I asked the question, who would want the job? And honestly, nobody really would want the job. I don't want the job. You know, preaching is wonderful when it's heaven and halos, when it's hallelujah and hosannas. I mean, it's really enjoyable. It's a lot of fun preaching then. I've had church members through the years tell me if the preacher doesn't step on my toes, I don't feel like I've been to church. They don't really mean that. They really don't mean, they don't want you stepping on their toes. And I'll tell you that Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel, Daniel, all of those prophets in the Old Testament, they weren't well liked. The, Jeremiah was thrown in a, in a muddy, deep well. He was thrown in prison. Uh, the king took his, his, his book that he had written, cut it in pieces, threw it in the fire, didn't want to hear it. Micaiah the prophet, uh, King Ahab said, this man only prophesies evil concerning me. Uh, Elijah was said to be troubling Israel with his preaching. And uh, Elijah said, I'm not the one troubling Israel. You are king. And the Lord told Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, I want you to go to the gate of my house and I want you to tell my people, mend your ways. Amend your ways and not your doings. That brothers and sisters, that'd be like me standing right there at those two doors and telling you all here sitting in this room, repent. All of you repent. When John the Baptist came in the wilderness of Judea preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, what was his message? Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I wouldn't want Jeremiah's job. I wouldn't want Hezekiah's job. The Lord called Hezekiah and said, I want you, not Hezekiah, Isaiah said, I want you to go and tell King Hezekiah, set your house in order, you're going to die. He did. That's what the Lord called him to do. And Elijah did what God called him to do. And Ezekiel did too. Now, Ezekiel's position. He's in Babylon, a thousand miles or more away from Jerusalem. His occupation, Ezekiel's occupation, he is an unemployed priest. He was taken captive away from Jerusalem he was a thousand miles away from Jerusalem in Babylon. And God says, Ezekiel, I want you to tell Jerusalem her sins. Now, how is that possible? Well, I'll tell you how it's possible. Because the people that were taken captive to Babylon were residents of Jerusalem. And... Ezekiel is an unemployed priest, but his new vocation is that he is called to be a watchman under the house of Israel. And his qualification for the job, Ezekiel saw visions of God and he received messages from God to deliver to his people Jerusalem that were right there in Babylon with him. Now remember what I said. They were there probably at the very tail end of that time period between 605 and 586 B.C. That's about 19 years. And Ezekiel's message is to those people of Jerusalem right there in Babylon. They thought they were going to be let go real soon. They thought they were going to go back home to their temple and take up where they left off. In a vision, God gets hold of Ezekiel's hair and carries him back to Jerusalem and shows him what's going on there and shows him that that temple is going to be destroyed. And Ezekiel had to come back to Babylon and tell the people, you may as well settle in here because we're not going back. Ezekiel's mission 
was to deliver bad news and good news for the Jews. There's my title. Bad news and good news for the Jews. The book of Ezekiel opens with Ezekiel seeing a UFO. An unidentified flying object. And what Ezekiel saw the best to my ability to understand is he saw this four-wheel drive vehicle flashing through the heaven at the speed of light, drawn by four living creatures. You can read about them. I've read about them. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't picture in my mind what they look like. I just know that these four creatures were dragging this vehicle through the heaven at the speed of light. And on that vehicle, there was a, a sapphire-colored throne. And it was bathed in amber-colored light. And this coincides with what John the Revelator saw in the book of Revelation in the fourth chapter, although John said he saw this throne of God, that it had a, a, a rainbow of emerald around the throne. And I'm thinking now, how in the world is that possible? How is that possible? Well, if you know your color wheel, you know that sapphire blue that's bathed in yellow or amber colored light, it's going to give off a green colored aura around it. Ezekiel did not see God. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. But Ezekiel sees this vision flashing through the heavens and from that throne he hears a voice that says, Son of man, stand on your feet and hear what thus saith the Lord. And he went on to tell him what I want you to tell my people Israel. So if we boil this thing down, Ezekiel, what Ezekiel heard is, Son of man, stand up and speak up. Brothers and sisters, don't you know that that's what God wants us to do? Amen. Stand up and speak up. Now listen to me. Brother Stapleton wasn't called to preach to the White House. Brother Stapleton wasn't called to preach to the House of Congress. Brother Stapleton wasn't called to preach to the Senate. Brother Stapleton, these last several years, has been called to preach to Huntington Missionary Baptist Church. That's you. Y'all have put up with me for a long time. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel's job was to preach to the people of Jerusalem and tell them their abominations. And he tells them, your nativity is of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite. And that was as much as telling these people, God's chosen people, that they were Philistines, that they were Neanderthals, that they were this uncultured, uncivilized, uncouth people. And, and that was God's message. That's what he wanted them to hear. And brothers and sisters, we're all just sinners saved by grace. But we're just like Israel. We, we're, we're nobodies that have been made somebody by the grace and mercy of God. Think about it today. The God of heaven has come here uh, by whatever means he chooses, whether in this vision that Ezekiel sees. And I want to tell you, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, he, he, is, he is brought on to the scene in the New Testament by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they come preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to this 
the world that they lived in and praise the Lord, whether prophet or preacher or whatever, this same message is going out today. Stand up and speak up and praise the Lord. Our world is not going to be changed by the folks that are in Washington, D.C. Our world is going to be changed by God's people doing what God wants them to do. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If the President of the United States will humble himself and pray and confess his sins and seek my face, I'll hear him and forgive his sin and heal his land. No. That's not what we read, is it? If who? Y'all know it. Praise the Lord. I want applause today. I knew you knew that. I knew you knew that. And brothers and sisters, that's going to be the way. I, I've got to share this with you. I've got a couple of wooden pins here. They're, they're, they're different. This one here, I'm told, is made out of the rarest wood in the world. And it was given to me by a man, a skillful man, who, who made it and cared enough about me to give it to me. And his name's Ray Skates. And he's sitting right back there. I still got it, Brother Ray. And I treasure it. I really do. Brother Ray came here, I think, in 1995. He joined this church. He said he was saved at home, I think, sitting in the breakfast nook. Am I right? Yeah, I, I remember. And I had the privilege to baptize him. He's been a member here ever since. And praise the Lord, he's still here. God bless you, brother. I appreciate that. And his wife is here. She came from another faith and, and she gave her testimony of salvation and joined the church. I had the privilege to baptize her. They brought their whole family and many times that whole pew back there and sometimes half of another would be filled with, with their family. We saw their grandchildren saved, many of them. Praise the Lord. But we still have burdens we're praying for, don't we? Yeah. I've got another pen here. It's made out of wood too. It looks similar to that, but this one's engraved. It says, world's greatest pastor. I keep this pen to keep my feet on the ground. I knew when it was given to me, I wasn't the world's greatest pastor. I didn't know when it was given to me that the person who gave it to me would only be here a short while. He left our church. And sadly, I'm not the world's greatest pastor anymore. The prophets of old weren't well liked because the preaching was hard. Because oftentimes, just like Ezekiel, they had hard messages to deliver. God loved Israel, and in spite of his love, in spite of his blessing, in spite of giving them a land flowing with milk and honey, in spite of filling their pockets when they left Egypt filled with gold and silver and precious stones and every good thing imaginable, in, in, in spite of, of, of giving them every kind of prosperity and freedom imaginable and loving them and blessing them, they, they, they refused to keep his commandments. They refused to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. They, they chose other gods. They, they made images of other gods and, and worshiped them. And they sacrificed their children to other gods. And in spite of God's pleading and his love and his, his, his warnings to them to turn back, turn back, and, and I will bless you. And, and, and they refused to listen. And ultimately, their nation was destroyed. And Ezekiel, the unemployed priest, called to be a watchman under the house of Israel, is given this job to tell my people their sins. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to tell you it's not all bad news. 
And I'm going to shift here in just a moment to some good news. I know you want to hear some. I had a great big long list of things that I was going to give to you uh, of how these United States of America is so similar to what Israel did. And, and folks, I want to tell you, we're walking right down the same road that Israel and Judah walked in their time. And in spite of the warnings, in spite of the pleadings to turn back, our nation's not listening either. But rather than, than give you that long list of Israel's sins, let me, let me read this to you. I, I discovered this months ago. I've been carrying it around ever since. A sociologist named of Carl Zimmerman in 1947, he wrote out a list of symptoms in his study. A sociologist is somebody that studies people and cultures and their, their, their habits, you know, uh, uh, and, and all that sort of thing. And this man studied the Greco-Roman civilization and he made a list of 11 things that ac um, accounted for the demise of that culture. Listen, number one, no-fault divorce. DOD, divorce on demand is what he was saying. Number two, disrespect for parenthood and parents. Have you ever seen a time when people disrespected their parents and looked down on parenthood as we're seeing in our time? Meaningless marriage rites and ceremonies. I don't know about you, but I've been seeing marriages move outside of the church. People don't want to get married in the church much anymore. They want to go somewhere else, and that's okay. You can do that. But I'm wondering why God's people don't respect the church so much anymore. Meaningless marriage rites and ceremonies. Defamation of past national heroes. Acceptance of alternative marriage. Widespread feminism and narcissism. We know what narcissism is. That's being in love with yourself. Ain't nobody prettier than I am. Anti-family sentiment. Acceptance of most forms of adultery. Rebellious children. Increased juvenile delinquency. Acceptance of all forms of sexual perversion. That's what he saw was the reason for the demise of the Greco-Roman world. And wow, when I read those, I just could not help but, 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 but think how similar it is to the attitude of people in our time right here in these United States of America. I know that's all bad news, but now I want to give you good news. Yes, Ezekiel was called to tell Jerusalem her abominations, to preach this message to Israel and let them know what they've been doing wasn't right. And the reason they were where they were and in the circumstance that they were in is because they weren't doing right in the sight of God. But now Ezekiel saw a vision in Ezekiel chapter 37. The Lord carried him out into this great big valley and Ezekiel said he saw this valley full of dry bones. And the Lord speaks to the prophet and he said, son of man, can these bones live? And the prophet said, Lord, thou knowest he said, you know, and God spoke to Ezekiel and he said, prophesy under the winds, prophesy and command the, the spirit to move. And the wind began to blow and, and muscle and sinew just started forming on those dead dry bones. And it's all of a sudden they began to stand up and they stood up a very great, a humongous army. And the Lord spoke to Ezekiel and he said, son of man, he said, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And folks, I want to tell you there's a couple of applications here that we need to consider. I know that people are looking forward to a time when, when the, the, the trumpet's going to sound, the archangel's going to shout, and all those dead bodies that are in the grave, praise the Lord. Same thing that Ezekiel saw there, that's going to happen again. Those dead bodies, I don't care if they've gone to completely dust, they're going to come together, bones are going to form, muscle and sinew and all those things that make up this body, they're going to stand up and they're going to come out of the grave. There's going to be a glorious resurrection one of these days. 
I don't think it's too far away. And if you're not ready to meet the Lord, if you've never been saved, you need to think about that and you need to get ready because if you're not, Amen. God help you. That day is going to come. But there's another application to this vision. The Lord said, this is the whole house of Israel. And I believe he was speaking about the, the Israel that was right there in Babylon right then. And he was talking about people who were dead spiritually, who were cold and indifferent, who had forsaken the right ways of the Lord. And folks, it's just like the church today. Have you ever seen a time like we're living in today? How long has it been since we've seen anybody saved? And aren't you hurting inside? Aren't you longing inside? Aren't you wishing that one Sunday with somewhere that we'd just see somebody come to the Lord and get saved? And I'm telling you, it's just like the church is almost dead and dried up and, and, and just indifferent. Wow, are we going to go home today just like we came? Or are we going to be energized? Don't you want to see and, and feel the wind of God's Holy Spirit fill this place and energize God's people to do exactly what the Lord called Ezekiel to do? Stand up and speak up. Declare the glories of the Lord. Declare His doings unto the end of the earth. Praise His holy name. Lift up Jesus before a lost and dying world. Folks, I'm telling you today, we need that same Holy Spirit of God that moved on those dead, dry bones there uh, in, in, in Israel to move on the church today. Amen. Just like it did at Pentecost. It's the same picture. The Lord told His people to wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. It was the same power that raised those dead, dry bones in the desert that energized the church and they preached and people were saved. You know, I, I just can't imagine being in a meeting like that. Man, we think, we, we think it's some kind of revival if we just see one soul saved, and it would be in comparison to where we're at. I want you to know today your pastor's hurting and longing and praying just to see anything, anything, anybody move, anybody stand and glorify God. I said Israel was a house divided. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God recognized that division. Ezekiel saw two sticks. One of them was, was named Ephraim. And Ephraim was, a, a, was one of the sons of, of Joseph. And Ephraim was, was used synonymously for Israel, the northern kingdom. Ephraim's stick and Judah's stick. They were a house divided, but the Lord joined those two sticks together. I'm telling you, he united Israel together and made them one stick, one house, and he blessed them and gave life to them. And I'm telling you today, you know, the church of Jesus Christ is divided in every kind of way imaginable. And I know we've got this denomination and that denomination. And this one believes this and this one believes that. I want to tell you, our God is able to overcome that. Amen. He's able to, to, to revive his people. And bring them together. I got to thinking about old George Whitfield. Back before the Revolutionary War, George Whitfield traveled up and down the eastern seaboard, the 13 colonies of this country, preaching the gospel. They say sometimes he preached to 20,000 people at one time, outdoor meeting. No, no microphone. You know, he, didn't, he didn't need one. Bless his heart. I didn't get that kind of voice. But, but he preached two and three sermons a day. Sometimes he'd preach an hour, sometimes two hours. And people were glad to hear him. Laura, your dad preached his last sermon right in this place. Wow, what a sermon it was too. Yeah, it was. He called me one day. He'd been sick and in the hospital. He said, I'm going to church. I'm going to preach my first sermon in a long time. He said, it's probably just going to be a devotion. I said, Harold, they don't want no big sermon anyway. People don't, don't want an hour sermon. They're ready to go after 30 minutes today. I, I'm serious. I'm just being honest with you. We're not hungry. The church of Jesus Christ is not 
hungry for the manna that comes from on high. And I want to tell you, I listen to the radio, I listen to these preachers preach, and I, I just stand in awe at what I'm hearing. It, it, it's not that the message ain't good. It's not that the food doesn't taste good. It's just we're not hungry. We're not hungry. And we're a house divided. And a house divided can't stand. But God, the same God that raised those, those dead dry bones, is able to energize his church. In Ezekiel chapter 47, I'm going to close. Ezekiel saw another vision. He told Israel, you may as well settle in here because your temple's going to be destroyed. And it was. The, 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 the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar was, was so, so intense. And you can read the book of Lamentations and see what it was like for those people who were walled up in, in Jerusalem when they surrounded that city and closed them in to where they could not escape. But Nebuchadnezzar destroyed that temple. It was gone. But Ezekiel said he saw another temple. A, a, a grand and, and glorious temple. And he said out of the eastern gate, he said there was a river flowing. A river of life was flowing. And he said he saw trees of life on either side of the river that, that, that bore all kinds of fruit. And, and Ezekiel's vision there in Ezekiel 47 is just like John's vision in, in Revelation. Same thing. He saw the house of the Lord and a river of water of life flowing out from it and the tree of life growing on either side of it. Let, let me tell you, folks, that, that that kingdom that Daniel saw in, in his time, Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel, they were contemporaries. They lived in the same time. They all saw the same vision. Jesus tells us in the New Testament, he said, let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amos the prophet said, the Lord, surely the Lord will do nothing except he reveals his secret unto his servant the prophets. God revealed to those men what, what, what he wanted him to tell the, the, the people and he doubled those visions. He, he bore witness by two, three, four, five different prophets at the same time. John saw the same thing that Ezekiel saw in his time. A river of water of life flowing out from the temple. And folks, I see the church that way. There's a river of water, of life that flows out from the church when she's energized by God's Holy Spirit. And the fruit that comes from that is souls being saved and lives being changed and, and people living for God and forsaking their sins and standing in the house and singing praises to the Lord and praying mighty prayers and preaching powerful sermons for God. There's good news in here. But we need to realize even the bad news is good news for us if we'll hear it and, and, and take heed to it. Folks, we need the Lord. Lost friend, I can't preach good enough to save you. No one in this room can pray well enough to save you. We can't sing beautiful enough to save you. We can't do enough good works to save you. Jesus Christ came all the way from heaven down here and picked up that old rugged cross and took our sins with it and went all the way to Calvary's hill and laid his life down there so that you could be saved. If you'll just listen. Amen. Hear, God's word says, and your soul shall live. Come to me and drink or drink from the fountain of living waters. Drink freely. It's accessible to you. You can come right now. You can fall right where you're at and call on the Lord and be saved. And church, we have a glorious opportunity uh, to praise the Lord. And that's what we need to be doing. I'm telling you, I'm tired of this coronavirus stuff. It's just about to kill us, you know. I love you all. I thank you for putting up with me. 
I thank you for taking the hard lessons. But I thank you for realizing that there's good news. Good news from God. 